I always like to start a lecture by getting a feeling of what you might have heard about feng shui. So please raise your hand if you ever read a book on feng shui. <laughs> or in, <laughs> about a magazine article. Yeah. Or um, so a show on TV where they mention feng shui. Oh, yes. Many, many times. A cartoon about feng shui. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, com those are becoming more and more popular. Um, you know comedian Dave Barry? Have you heard about him? Well, he's a syndicated columnist, and he says, you know, tongue in cheek, but I think it's true, that you, you should always watch out what happens in California because it ends, up it ends up happening to the rest of the country. And in California, feng shui has become so popular that people are demanding that the place be evaluated and approved by a feng shui master before they buy it, either be a business place or a home place. Wow. So they're coming up with a seal where realtors can have their, their signs on the, on the front yard. They're going to have a seal that is feng shui approved. <laughs> <laughs> so feng shui is becoming very popular. Um, however, it hasn't been probably, it has only been in the United States for about 40 years, about 60 years in the United Kingdom. Now, it is business people that brought feng shui to the Western world, and this is how it happened. You know how many companies in the United States and in Europe open branches of their businesses in the Far East, and uh, a favorite place to do that, to have corporate offices, uh, to control all the operations in the East is, you know what city? Hong Kong. Hong Kong. <laughs> so, a lot of... Um, business people from the United States had to go to Hong Kong and work, and they were faced with situations where they had just built a, a huge uh, office building, and uh, the people didn't want to walk in until the place was evaluated by a feng shui master and approved, and um, declared to be auspicious, as auspicious means of good omen. And uh, so in the beginning, this. Uh, these Western business people, they were not very open to it. It was an annoyance. But then they found out that once they brought the feng shui master in and they applied the, uh, the suggestions, the advice that the feng shui master had given them, productivity did increase and that they themselves found themselves being less stressed out. And a recent example is um, the opening of a uh, a theme park for Disney in China. It, this is mainline China, not Hong Kong. And uh, as usual, people wanted the place to be, from the get-go, from the floor plans, they wanted the place to be evaluated by a feng shui master, which happened. And one of the things the feng shui master did for the CEO of Disney China was he placed a mirror behind the CEO's computer, behind the monitor. And so he said, you know, he was quoted in an interview as saying, well, you know what, now when my secretary needs my attention, when my assistant needs my attention, she just stands on the door and I can see her. Whereas before there was always that awkward moment of, you know, trying to interrupt somebody without startle, startling them. Now who here has their chair facing a wall or whereas the monitor is against the wall? Nobody else? Okay, so that is actually, is actually good um, because in feng shui, one of the main principles of feng shui in the office is that you need to be able to see the door when you're working but not be right in front of the door. Raise your hand if you have this situation in your workplace, that you're able to see the door or the entrance to your cubicle but you're not in the path of the door. So that's, that's really good feng shui. So those of you who have that condition, are, you're already off to a good start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what is feng shui? Feng shui means wind and water, which are the forces that um, move the world. So if you imagine that your life was a little sailboat in the middle of the ocean, where would that sailboat end if you didn't know how to work that sail? wherever the winds and the water currents take you. <laughs> so sometimes life feels like that, like you're just being taken places by the currents of what happens at work, the currents of what happens at home, what happens in the country. And, uh, and you just find yourself at the end of that being effect, 
of the circumstances in your life instead of being cause over what happens in your life and being the designer of your destiny. So if you learn to work those sails, you will have more control over where that little boat ends, wouldn't you? There was an, uh, the Turks, not people from Turkey, uh, were very famous long, long time ago because they designed a square sail that you could actually go faster in the direction opposite the wind. So isn't that interesting? <coughs> so I have had clients. Um, I, I used to live in Mississippi about 10 years ago. So I had clients in Mississippi that were in the realty business. And in a year when realtor, realtors were not doing well, when the house market was down, they did exceptionally well. That is going faster in the direction opposite the wind. <coughs> so there's always going to be currents, like financial currents in your life, um, layoff currents in some businesses. But what happens from that, whether something is a blessing or a tragedy, it largely depends on your internal condition. Let's use an example. What do you think is one of the worst news that you could receive at home? Death. Death of a loved one. Um, I said at home, right? But yeah. I meant to say at work. Oh. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, yes, at home, that would you're be. Fired. You're fired. Yeah. Yeah. You're fired. And so, sorry about that. So what, what is one of the worst news that you could receive at work yeah. that you, you have been laid off? Yeah. For one person, that could be a tragedy. That could mean that they could lose their house. It could mean that they would have a strained relationship with their spouse. It could mean in over time, a divorce, it could mean so many bad things. For another person, that could mean a change of careers into an activity that makes them feel more fulfilled and a better life. And the main difference is not what happens outside, but what is inside the person, how the person is able to center and balance themselves. So going back to the meaning of feng shui, the, um, feng means wind and shui means water. The word wind in Chinese is also an equivalent for wealth. And the word water in Chinese is also an equivalent for money. So when we're talking about feng shui, we could also say that we're talking about wealth and money. So um, let's uh, do a, a short evaluation here. <coughs> and. Um, Raise your hand if you completely love your job. Really? <laughs> like completely, 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 like in love with your job. Couldn't, couldn't be better. Okay. Well, that's great, Cheryl. That's so, I you. I so I'd say probably about twenty percent. So super. Twenty percent of the room, would you so say, is uh, <laughs> completely in love with their job? Yeah. And um, raise your hand if. Um, you believe that you are very well compensated for your age, your level of experience, how many years you have been in your line of work compared to other people who are you know, about the same age, same education, and same level of experience. Raise your hand if you believe that you are very handsomely compensated for your work. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> I find that uh, is it about 80% of people that I would ask this question would say that they believe that they could be better compensated for the <clears throat> amount of uh, energy, knowledge that they have, the years that they have been in the business, and, uh, and really how much they are putting into that. So. When, uh, uh, when we're talking about feng shui in the office, this is a very important part. First of all, you know, whenever you're talking about feng shui, you're really talking about wealth and money, which would make it sound <laughs> like it's a really, really um, materialistic art, or like these are the two most important things in life, which is uh, not actually true. Feng Shui is actually a fragment of a poem, and I will give you a handout that has the poem. But of course, translated to English, it doesn't sound so poetic. But uh, originally, it, it was something like, the winds are mild, the sun is bright, the water is clear, and the trees are lush. 
And this was supposed to express what were the ideal conditions for human life to thrive. And then for short, over time, people started referring to the, what the poem conveyed as only wind and water, which can also be translated as wealth and money. So most people would say that they would want to encourage more abundance into their life. There have been very few people I have met, and it doesn't matter how much money they make or how wealthy they are, most people say that they would like to invite a little bit more abundance into their home. So how, um, there is something that you can do in feng shui to very quickly increase your possibility of accepting abundance. But I won't tell you that just yet. <laughs> We're going to build up to that. <laughs> First of all, we have to uh, set the stage, set the stage to understand feng shui. I, um, I suppose that of all the subjects and all the speakers you have had in your group, this is probably one of the most original subjects that you have had. Right? So it's probably one of the subjects about which you know the least. So that's why I want to have some groundwork to work on. And, uh, so feng shui is originally from China, and it is believed to be about 6,000 years old. Now, what was the job of the feng shui practitioner in ancient times? It was to find places where you might build a palace or a village and have a very good chance of success. Now, this in times where, when there was no uh, weather channel, when there were no historical records, if you wanted to find a good place to settle, you had to take some things into consideration. You had to become a very good observer of nature. So that's what the feng shui practitioners did. This is probably why, uh, what the pioneers did also when they first came to the United States. You know, they come to a huge land. How did they find places where they could survive? What was the number one thing they looked for? Water. 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 What kind of water? Fresh, Fresh water. Fresh water. water that they could drink and that they could use to water their crops. Um, what would be the second thing that they would look for soil after water? water. Yes. Soil. Fertile soil. Good soil. And after fertile soil? You don't, you know, when you move into a place and start farming, you don't have a harvest right away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Food, food that you could gather, yeah. you know, fish and game and uh, fruit. And the fruit and fruit and nuts they come from trees, so vegetation, very strong, healthy vegetation. So they would look at other signs. What would, if you went to a place and you found that there were only young trees, that you didn't find any trees that looked like they were older than thirty years, what could you conclude? Fire. It could be a fire, a tornado, some kind of tragedy has happened in this place because there's only new trees and no old trees. And uh, except, you know, with, with certain exceptions, what we consider tragedies or um, acts of nature, they can be cyclical. So where there has been earthquakes before, it is more possible that there will be earthquakes again than a place when, where there never had been earthquakes. Where there has been a tornado, there's a higher possibility that there will be tornadoes than in parts of the country that don't have tornadoes, right? What would, uh, would you think if you saw there were lots of old, vibrant um, trees, but no new growth, no new trees? There's something up with the soil. There could be uh, pollution. Something is stunting new growth. If you found lots of re, um, rounded stones in an area that was <coughs> dry and away from the water, what could you conclude? Flooding. This area floods. And you know there's some regions in the world that they can have really bad floods every seven or nine years. So what if you came to a place and thought, oh, this is a really good place to build a house, to build my farm, and seven years later everything goes away with the water? In China, in, the, they, uh, in their belief system, it is very important to take care of the remains of their ancestors. So they also needed to find a good place where you could 
build a cemetery. Because you don't want great grandmother's remains flying, you know, swimming away with the latest <laughs> monsoon, you know. And um, so all these considerations, for example, if instead of finding rounded stones, you found rocks that were very sharp, that could be an indication of avalanches or, or earthquakes. So feng shui masters had to learn to read all these signs in nature in order to make smart decisions of where to settle and where there would be a really good possibility that a human life could thrive. And this is what they found that was the best. So you already said it, that you needed to be close to water. We agree on that, right? But if you're too close to water, you could get flooded. Not a good idea. So you have to have some elevation from water. And uh, China is in the same, um, about the same distance from the equator as uh, the United States. So it has very similar seasons. In the United States, what is the warm side of the house? The north, the south, the east, or the west? Uh, in the morning, the east. Well, in the morning, the east, the in west, the in the afternoon. But there's one side that receives sunshine constantly, south. and that is the south side. Whereas the north side receives very little sunshine. And I, I lived for five years in Iowa. In Iowa, the north side got no sunshine at all. Here, because we're closer to the equator, there's times of the year when we get a little bit of sunshine on the north side. So one of the things that Feng Shui Masters concluded is that you needed to have sunshine in your entrance so you could have a happy entrance. So they recommended facing the door to your home or to your village or to your palace towards the south. So you got plenty of sunshine. Where do the really, really cold winds come from in the fall when it starts cooling off here? From the north, and it is the same in China. So wouldn't it make sense to have a protection from the winds? So they also recommended that you look for a property that had a hill to the north or a mountain to the north so that would protect you from the winds. Now, this area of Tennessee, East Tennessee, gets a lot less tornadoes than the Nashville area. Why is that? The ridges, right? So the Chinese master recommended that you have ridges on the sides. And when you look at this, it's sort of like an armchair, you know, a mountain or a large hill, or large hill at the back, and ridges or mountain, I mean, hill ranges on the sides. And uh, that is sort of like the arms of the chair. Now, for a chair to be completely comfortable, what you, do you need in front of it? An ottoman. An ottoman. <laughs> now, the ottoman. <laughs> Is the ottoman taller or lower than the seat? Lower than the seat. So across from the water, you wanted a low valley. Why? Because if you had a huge mountain in front of the water, the mountain would cover up the sun for you. Okay? So this is all common sense, right? There's, there's nothing weird or woo-woo about what I'm talking about. <laughs> But that is not all of feng shui. Feng shui has common sense and it also has uncommon sense. The uncommon sense has to do with things that our science is just beginning to understand. Did you know that the planet, that the Earth has electromagnetic, an electromagnetic field? Have you heard about it? You know, there's these photos from NASA. There's these graphics that they made that they show you the electromagnetic field of the planet. Um, anything that is electromagnetic in its nature is going to have a field. Like if you get your hand close to a computer, you will feel a little bit of a vibration there. And if you get even stronger on the projector, what is one device at home that has a lot of energy when you get your hands? The refrigerator and the television, right? Uh, you can, in the old TVs, the tubes, <laughs> when you got your hand to the TV, you could feel the static. As a, as a tingling in your hand, right? So how many people have we got here? So we have an even number of people. So with a person, you're going to do an exercise with the person next to you, and you're going to discover something about your bodies today. <laughs> so just sit, 
sit very sit very comfortable, you know, just facing the table for right now. And then then later, later on, you're going to face each other. So um, clap three times. And now rub, rub, rub your hands until you start feeling a little bit of heat. Are you starting to feel a little bit of heat? Yeah. Now with the air conditioning right over here, I'm, I'm getting, it's taking me a little bit longer. <laughs> but it's starting to happen. So you're creating friction, mm -hmm. right? Now put your hands, and make sure that your fingers are not open like this, but they're touching, and just put your hands across from each other and uh, pretend that you are playing a very, very heavy accordion. Are you feeling a little bit of a tingling yes. between your hands? Some people uh, describe it as warmth. Some people say it's like, t uh, like tickles. Mm -hmm. And some people just describe it as a pool, similar to that pool that you feel when you're bringing a magnet to the refrigerator. <laughs> magnet. magnet to the refrigerator. So now turn to the person next to you. So make sure you know the, the two of you, the two of you. And uh, actually, you guys, uh, you need to turn this way. <laughs> Yeah, the two of you are facing the wrong person. <laughs> so, yeah. Do it again, and now don't touch the hands of the other person, just feel them. Now get your hands a little bit closer to you, like this. Like you're doing push-ups, and then go closer to the other person, but don't touch them. Are you feeling something? No? <laughs> it, some, it may take for some, some people are more sensitive than others. You know, just like some people are more tolerant to heat than others. <laughs> so, has anybody not felt it yet? Raise your hand if you didn't feel your own energy. I'm sorry, I'm feeling you. But you're not feeling the energy of the other person, but did you feel your own energy when you were doing this? Okay, so everybody has felt something. So what you discovered today is that your body is electromagnetic. That's why we get shocked so much in the winter, you know. I'm, yeah. The static, you know, when you go to the grocery store in the winter and try to reach for one of those coolers and you get shocked, you get shocked because you are electromagnetic. Trees are electromagnetic, right? That's where, when there's lightning, lightning usually goes for the trees. They're good conductors of electricity. And uh, the, our scientists are starting to realize that everything in the universe is actually electromagnetic. The difference is the, the strength of this electromagnetism. Like, for example, a rock probably has less electromagnetism than a plant, and a plant has less electromagnetism than a person. But when we analyze uh, molecules, or mole everything in life is made of molecules, right? And all molecules are made of atoms. And atoms have particles inside of them that have charges. They're positive or negative or they're neutral. So everything really in life is electromagnetic. The Chinese called this electromagnetism, they gave it a name and they called it qi. Okay. <laughs> so some of you have heard about qi. If you ever went to an acupuncturist, for example, you, they probably use the term qi. The acupuncturist uh, help the qi circulate through your body. And they have found, uh, raise your hand if you're not familiar with acupuncture. That doesn't mean that you had acupuncture done on you, but that you know about the concept. So um, in acupuncture, they find out that there's like this invisible roads. Just like we have a system with our vessels, our blood vessels, the arteries and the veins, we also have a system with our nerves. You know, our nerves go all over the body. And there's also a system of this chi that travels through our bodies, but we cannot see it. But the Chinese acupuncturists spent many, many years trying to figure out where those were, where those channels were. And um, if you doubt acupuncture, consider this. In Chinese hospitals, women are having C-sections with no anesthesia, just with acupuncture. Wow. You know that's something that cannot be faked, yeah. right? <laughs> So our Western science is just coming to a point where we don't have to go purely on, a, on faith, on belief that yes, there, our body is electromagnetic, and yes, the electromagnetism in our bodies follows certain patterns and certain paths. 
our science is starting to, uh, to detect that now there are devices that can measure how much chi or how much electromagnetism is in each of the main channels of your body, and each of those is related to one of your fingers. There are, there are 10 organs in your body, and they are paired in twos. And there's a different essences in this type of, this electromagnetism is classified in five different kinds. And each kind controls two organs. So that's, that's another really fascinating area. We could do a feng shui for the body lecture or workshop. But it's, it's very important to understand this concept of qi. The things that we need to live, uh, how long could a person have be without food? and still survive. Actually, it's actually, it's actually about a month. I mean, you would get, you would get pretty sick, but uh, it'd be probably about a month before people start dying. Uh, how long could you be without water? Like four days. Like four days. Four, yeah. Yeah. somewhere. Yeah, that's water. How long could you be without air? Five minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> if you, you know, the, probably the, the strongest swimmer in the world might get close to five minutes. For the rest of us, it might be two to three minutes. How long could you live without chi? Not a second. It is another form of nutrition that we have. And actually, chi is translated into our language as the life force. Who here watched uh, the first uh, movie of Star Wars? <laughs> Did anybody here not watch Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't start watching Star Wars. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. 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 When, the, when George Lucas made this movie, he had Joseph Campbell as a consultant. And Joseph Campbell it was, uh, one of the things he did is he studied the philosophies of the Far East. So they were actually trying to find a way to include chi into the movie. And chi is translated into English as life force. But that didn't sound um, uh, warrior-like enough uh, to say life force, you know, but to use the force that had a better impact. But that's what they were talking about, about following the force. So when something has a lot of chi, it is very, very much alive. When something hasn't, doesn't have a lot of chi, we say it lacks life. Now, we're not, I'm not going to tell you that this table is alive, of course, <laughs> <laughs> or that it talks to me. But there are some areas in a home that have more life than others, and there are some areas in an office that have more life than others. And let's go with the home first because it's just easier to, it's easier to relate because everybody's home is different, whereas everybody's workplace could be. I mean, everybody's home is uh, different but has many of the same things in it. You know, you all have bedrooms, you all have a living room or a family room, whereas the workplace can be widely different for different people. So, have you ever been in a home that had a um, formal dining room and then a daily dining area? Mm -hmm. Which one felt more alive? The daily. daily. The daily. And you, you know, you're not hesitating when you tell me that. It is because you have perceived something. You have perceived a certain warmth about the area that you use more. And remember that one of the definitions when you felt the energy in your own hands was warmth. So, when we use something, and we use it a lot, we sort of charge it. And, uh, and we don't use it, it gets discharged, right? And uh, some people have issues with the word energy, thinking that's something woo-woo. But I'm talking about energy <laughs> the same way we're talking about the energizes, energizer batteries, right? You know, I, have a, I have two boys, and that means lots of trains. So I got a rechargeable batteries and a charger. And, uh, and so you charge the batteries, the batteries discharge. The same happens with a person. There are certain things that charge you, and there are certain things that drain you. Do you have, can you think, um, close your eyes if you want to, or keep your eyes open, but think of a coworker 
that always perks you up. When you are around this person, you feel happier, you feel more productive, you, you anticipate their visit. Have you got it? Do you have that person in your mind? Now th think about a co-worker that when they're coming, if you, if you work in a cubicle, you wish you had a door. <laughs> <laughs> and this person comes over and they start talking to you and you start feeling <laughs> tired and you start slouching on your chair and your shoulder starts hurting and things like that. You've all experienced that. You know? So there are circumstances and there are people who charge you and there are circumstances and people who drain you. One of the things that drains you at work is uh, the computer. It used to be that, uh, you know, I started working with computers and graphic design about 20 years ago in Ecuador. And uh, it used to be that it was the exception to say, you know, I work all day in front of a computer. And that's one thing that you would tell your, your ophthalmologist when you get you got your eyes checked. and. Uh, about 15 years ago, when I came to the United States and went to the ophthalmologist, and I, I told him my thing of, you know, I work all day in front of a computer, and he, and he asked me, well, who doesn't these days? Now it seems you can't have a workstation without a computer, and electronic, electronics tend to drain you. Now, how can you counteract that? What could charge you positively? Going outside. Going outside. Having a window, <laughs> going to the beach. <laughs> no, there, there are certain things that you can do. <laughs> there are certain things that you can do, but um, bringing in nature to the office is one of the most effective ways in which you can charge yourself. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a window, maybe you get a little bit of sunshine that has a positive effect on you. Maybe you look outside and you see trees or you see the mountains in the distance. If you have that situation, you're a very lucky person. Maybe there's a window. Now, most windows in businesses today don't open. But if you have a window that can be cranked, letting a little bit of fresh air in could be very positive. Now, what if you don't have a window? You can still bring in nature. There are certain plants that actually thrive under fluorescent lights. <laughs> but let's, let's say you, you totally don't have a green thumb and plants don't do well. So how else can you bring in nature? You can have... Say nature. Yeah. You can have the sounds of nature. You can have a CD that plays the sounds of, of nature. You could have uh, flowers, fresh flowers in a vase. Those little water fountains. You could have water fountains. But let's say yeah, that's impractical. Let's say that's impractical, or let's say that there are very strict codes in the place where you work where you can't have certain things. But you can still bring in a painting or a photograph of nature. <laughs> uh, uh, or a little thing with a beta fish, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, so bringing things about nature charges you. Whereas, you know, the, the contact with electronics tends to drain most people and dogs. Cats, however, benefit from uh, this energy from electronics. So if you have a cat when you're working at home and the cat jumps on your lap when you're working at your computer, they're actually trying to help you. <laughs> of course not if they want to sleep on your keyboard like my cat does. <laughs> but if they jump on your lap, they, they actually might be helping you. And it's, it sounds like a joke, but it's true. So bringing in nature, there's many different ways to bring in nature. Let's say that you were in an office and that you were um, working a temp job where you could not personalize your office. You can still, ha still have a beautiful wallpaper with nature on your computer screen. Mm -hmm. So things that, things that help you recharge yourself. Now one of the biggest complaints, concerns of people today is stress. Raise your hand if you're never stressed. Even the people who love their job get stressed, but that's actually a really good strategy. Um, if you have a, a natural environment close to your office, when you take a break to get outside to feel some sunshine, some fresh air, it can be a very positive thing. Outside air, even in polluted areas, even downtown, outside air is better than inside air. That's a very important thing to remember. 
So stress. So what is stress? Can anybody describe stress for me? I hear some sighs. Yeah. <laughs> it's your, it's your, your body's reaction to certain elements that are going on. Your body's you. reaction to certain elements that are going on around you. It's a reaction and it's physical, right? It's not just emotional, mental, it's physical. And it usually comes with what? What does your body do? Tense. Your body becomes tense. You know, when you're stressed out, you don't tend to relax and take it easy. You tend to get um, sort of contracted. Contracted, you, you tend to get tense. Now, what are the most common sources of stress? Work. He said, let's, th let's think about work. No, what could be, it could be co-workers, you know, personal human relationships could create a lot of stress. Deadlines. Deadlines. And what is a deadline? When something has to be done. Something has to be done by a certain time, and if you are feeling stressed out, you probably have the perception that the amount of things of work you need to do in that period of time is too much to be contained in that period of time to get to your deadline. So first we have co-workers is one source of stress. It could also be customers, right? So people. People can be a source of stress. Time constraints can be a source of stress. And uh, another source of stress is the perceived difficulty of a job. For example, when you have been asked to do something that you are not sure that you can do, something that requires for you to study or something where there's a learning curve. Right? Can you think of any other major source of stress? Family, bills. Family, that would include Money. people. Money, yeah, finances. Well, uh, let's say at work. <coughs> oh, at work, right? We haven't gone home. <laughs> we haven't gotten home. We can get there. <laughs> Since I was asked to speak about feng shui in the office today, so that's what we're focusing. But we can we can talk about that later. What about job change? I mean, reductions, layoffs, changes. The threat, the threat that that you might lose your job. You know, insecurity. Sometimes just uh, changing a boss, and if you get a different boss. Yeah, really of course. Because you're not yeah. sure exactly. If you get a new boss, you are not sure how they're going to handle things and how they're going to like everybody or how they're going to change procedures. So, and, but that would fall into people, right? Bosses are people too, right. after all. Uh, well, most of them. <laughs> most of them. <laughs> okay. So, change procedures, any type of change. People yeah, not changes. Change. You know, people people don't change. usually take change uh, well, but change is part of life. Change, and, and that's a, a very big part of traditional Chinese philosophy, is that change is constant. And the better you adapt to change, the happier yeah. you tend to be. So, feng shui can help you with all of this. Which one would you like to start with first? <laughs> Which one is uh, would you consider is the most important? Out of all the stressors. Out of all the stressors. Co-workers. Co Co-workers. Okay. So how, how do people create stress in you? Give me an example of how, how are people. They mm -hmm. Attitude. Somebody giving an attitude. Backstabbing. Ability. Backstabbing. What else? No, this stuff don't we? I have Somebody so backstabbing. Expectations. What else did we mention? Attitudes. 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 Yeah. yeah. And sometimes just personality. Sometimes it can be the pitch yeah. of somebody's voice bothers you. Yeah. Right. So there's so, there's so many ways in which people can rub each other the wrong way. So there's a sharpness about everything that you mentioned, right? Um, Usually the stressors that come to us through people have a quality of sharpness about it, and I'll explain it better. You know, it's like, like knives. <laughs> and uh, so what you do in feng shui is you soften every sharp corner in the office. So there's many different ways to sharpen corners. For example, here we have the sharp corners, right? If you put a wooden piece of molding around that, that was rounded, a corner round, then you will soften that corner. Say that you have a desk that instead of ending uh, really rounded here, which is really, really positive, like these chairs, in, I mean these tables you see, and the chairs all have rounded corners. Sometimes you get fancy designers that decide that it's not good enough, you need a really sharp thing where everybody hurts their thighs. 
So if you have a situation like that, then you can, for example, put a plant like um, um, a, f a rhododendron kind of plant that uh, sort of goes over. So people naturally, when they're going by there, they tend to feel the plant before they hit the table. So putting soft things on corners, covering up the corners, a traditional feng shui cure, in feng shui we talk about cures, for a sharp corner is to put a tall plant in front of it to cover it up. So what would you put over a person though? <laughs> <laughs> now the, the interesting thing, the interesting thing is that when there's excessive sharpness in the environment, it irritates people <clears throat> because it reminds them of the possibility of having accidents. So when you control these things in the office, the mood of everybody tends to improve. And let's go a little bit home, though this applies also to work. <laughs> things that get stuck, aren't those irritating? Drawers getting stuck? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Cabinet doors getting stuck? Doors that make squeaky noises? Oh, yeah. There are many things that you could have that are mild irritations at work or at home. Now, you could have a, a drawer that gets stuck, you know, and you just jiggle a little, jiggle it a little bit and then it opens. You ever had one of those? Those were very popular when furniture used to be more made of metal, you know. <laughs> With uh, differences in temperature, they could get stuck. <coughs> so, you could have one of those desks and uh, any day, they might not affect you very much. The day you have a headache, that could be the day that drawer ends up crashed on the floor. <laughs> right? So, uh, is that somebody that was yeah. supposed to be here? I think so. Oh, okay. So, um, I guess we can wait. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. All right. So, anything that is a mild irritant in the environment is going to affect people's moods. And if you address that, people are going to be naturally better tempered. And it might sound like it's too simple or too easy or like that wouldn't work, but th that is one of those things that you would have to try. And it, it has a really amazing effect. For example, I have had clients who had the sharp, sharp corners in their home covered and they started sleeping better. So that would be one way to deal with irritation with uh, coworkers. Another way to deal with irritation with coworkers is by having enough room to walk. When you are in an environment where you have to cross somebody, sometimes people put furniture too close to each other, and sometimes you also, that also translates into feeling like people are impinging on you like there's not enough elbow room. So watching the distance between, between pieces of furniture can be very helpful. If you are in a situation where you have to step sideways so somebody else can get through, or in some places, you know, walk into an office so somebody else can get through, that, that is also a mild irritant. So feng shui can be very helpful with this. Which uh, other stressor would you like to address? We had mentioned people was one, deadlines was another. Um, How can you deal with the deadlines? Deadlines. The, the deadline, you know, being stressed about a deadline is a problem with time, isn't it? So there's this amount of time and there's this amount of work and it, this boss must be crazy to think that this amount of work can fit into this amount of time. But in a, Traditional Chinese philosophy, which is the basis for feng shui, time is considered as belonging to heaven, to things spiritual. And uh, space is considered as belonging to earth, things that are material. But in the Chinese concept, it's, uh, things that are material have to do with action because everything is constantly changing, everything is constantly moving. And there's a correspondence. Whenever you feel that you are lacking time, organize your space. And you will expand time. 
So sometimes, even though you have a deadline, and it feels like you should just get started with this project right now, because otherwise you're not gonna finish it up, it might be worth it to devote an hour or half an hour to organize your space before you put all your strength and all your energy into this project. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now I'll give you a simple example. As I said, I have two boys and I have two cats, and they're all very fond of pens and pencils. So sometimes I get a phone call and I need to write something down and I can't find a pencil. So it might take me 30 seconds to find a pen or a pencil to write something down or bring up my computer so I can type it on the computer. <coughs> How long should it have taken me to find a pen or a pencil? Like five seconds. Five seconds would be too much. Like it should be five minutes. One second. Yeah. You know, the, the, the tools that I use for work with, should be within easy reach of me. So I need a pen, take the pen. I need a pencil, take the pencil. If I have to spend 30 seconds looking for a pen, can you see how much time I have wasted? They did a study recently of um, um, analyzing film and different people in their eight hour um, work day and actually figuring out how, for how long of that time they were actually productive. And no one was, more, was productive for more than four hours. Those were the most efficient. Wow. And the phone calls, the trips to the restroom, the getting coffee, um, correcting mistakes is a big one. So uh, think about feng shui can help you in this way with organization. If you organize your space so it's really efficient for you, <coughs> your time expands. And it really is like magic. When you feel like, and, and it's also very good for you when you feel that you cannot concentrate. If you organize your space, then you, um, you tend to do better. You tend to concentrate better and you tend to utilize your time better. What other stressor have we mentioned? We have mentioned people, deadlines. Change. Change or expectations also and when you um, have a high learning curve, right? And um, why is this stressful? What feelings does this trigger in a person that it is so stressful? Fear of failure. The fear of failure or insecurities, right? When you feel insecure, the interesting thing is the more insecure you feel, the less you can think. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> there's two parts of the nervous system in a person. There's a part that controls thinking and healing. And there's a part that is the fight, flight, or freeze mechanism. You have heard about that, right? The thing is that when the fight, um, fight, flight, or freeze mechanism kicks in, the other part of your nervous system, the one that does the digestion, the healing, and the thinking, tends to shut down proportionally. You cannot, you cannot be um, composing poetry when you are running away from the lion. Right. So our bodies tend to shut down. So sometimes there are signs in the office space that trigger a response of the fight, flight, or freeze mechanism. And that affects our thinking. And there may be things that you would never you would never think they affect you, but they do. Can anybody think of something that could be happening in a building that would that could make you feel that it's not safe? Well, a fire, that would be an, an extreme situation. But um, even, fire alarms, alarms. even testing the alarms, you know, can make you feel like that. But what if you were supposed to have a fire extinguisher over there, and the last time somebody took it out and it was never replaced? What would you be consciously or unconsciously connecting to every time you see that? We don't have a fire extinguisher if there was an emergency we wouldn't be able to control it. Um, say, for example, that somebody has wor was working on, a, on an outlet and they forgot to put the lid back on and the wires are exposed. And what is part of your mind thinking about that? I better not touch that, right? So there may be things, there could be a part of a ceiling tile that is falling. There can be so many things in your environment that are just not right and that could be triggering responses of your fight or flight mechanism. 
So the more you work with your space to make it feel safe, the more able you become to think. Another way that you can do that is by having what I was telling you before, the, what is called in feng shui the power position, which means when you sit at your workstation, you are able to see the door or you're able to see the entrance to your cubicle, but you're not right in front of it. Because then, uh, when you are in a situation where somebody has put a desk against the wall, your computer over there, and then you have to face the wall, and you don't know what's happening behind you, part of your mind is going to be trying to guess what's going on. <laughs> by the sounds, by the smells, right? And uh, so, People have found that um, when uh, you, I, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, when you feel that you have the control of the environment, when you are able to see everything, you feel you have the command of the room. Having the command of the room is essential in feng shui because that gives you the feeling that you really can understand everything that's happening around you. And when you have that feeling, you tend to produce more. So people will have 20, 25% increase in productivity just by changing the layout of their office. Isn't that interesting? Okay. Uh -huh. Some people are more sensitive to it than others. But what if you're in a situation where you cannot change it? Right. So there's always something you can do in feng shui. You can put a mirror on the wall behind your monitor that allows you to see the door. So nobody could come and startle you and go boo, right? Yeah. <laughs> People that, that have been at war, they never sit with their back to a door. Because they, they, have, um, they have been in extreme situations where not being aware of your environment could mean the difference between life and death. So in a, there's something for us to learn from that. For most of us who have not been in extreme situations, but maybe you had a sibling that was especially annoying and that would like to startle you. And, and you are all familiar with the experience of being surprised or being startled, and it's not comfortable. So having the potential for that to happen eight hours of your day is not good. I do want to show you how uh, long do we have. Oh, okay, well, so I, um, I'm going to show you some images. It's Fair not changing. Yeah, it went to Fair sleep. Time, yeah. Oh, okay. Did I do something? Okay, there it is. Okay. So. I want to uh, show you the image of the feng shui formation, you know, the main feng shui formation that we were talking about. My computer talks. So this is the basic formation that I was telling you about. The, um, the armchair formation that you can see here. So in a traditional uh, Chinese uh, symbology, they would say you have to have a turtle at the back, or a hill that is sort of rounded, very cool, a tiger, a crouching tiger, you know, crawling after the prey, and a dragon. The Chinese dragon is like a snake with legs. It's not a, like our Western dragon with wings and a big belly. It's just an undulating shape. So, and then across the, the valley, they said you, I mean, across the river, they said you had to have a red phoenix, 
which is like a, like an eagle in flight, you know, the, a, a valley that has those very soft changes in the in the geography. So the armchair formation has a, mo a mountain or hill like a turtle at the back, a tiger and a dragon at the sides, and uh, across from the body of water you have a uh, a bird bird in flight shaped valley, and. Uh, you need a flat plot of land that is close to the water but not at the same height as the water. And that is the ideal feng shui formation. So that's seen the, with a bird's eye view or over there. And this is how it would look from the front or from the side. So any questions with that? Now, how does this apply to your office? In your office, you are the house. So behind you, you need something solid like a solid wall or some uh, bookcases or a, a desk and a hutch behind you. Something that gives you a feeling of being protected. Now, if you have other high pieces of furniture in your office, you put them on the sides, okay? And across from your desk, you have low pieces of furniture. You, don't, you wouldn't put your large bookcase across from the desk. You would put a love seat or, or chairs or a, a buffet type of furniture or a table. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you get the protection at the back and the openness at the front. And this also applies to how to arrange a bedroom. It applies to your entrance door. This is the most important concept <coughs> in feng shui. The idea of having a protection at the back, like my children like to say, because you don't have eyes at the back of your head. And having open space in front of you because that gives you the impression that the future is open to you. And uh, if you have any high things, you know, you can also put them on the sides, not at the front, so it doesn't block your future. In feng shui, we say what's at the back is the past, and what's at the front is the future. So you want a very solid past supporting you so you can plunge ahead into the future with no obstructions. Does that make sense? So then I'm, I'm going to show you how this applies, and it's in your handouts. If you would please uh, distribute the handouts. In your handouts, I included a, um, a picture. Yeah, you know, feng shui is, a, is an extremely complex art, and uh, there's only so much I can share with you in, a, in 45 minutes. But yeah, in feng shui, we consider, we consider the colors, we consider the materials, we consider the shapes. And uh, we are seeking to have some balance and some harmony in the space. Basically, what we do in feng shui is we look at, in nature, what you would consider is a safe place in nature, then we try to bring those elements into the home or into the workplace so that you can also feel safe and that it becomes believable that you could thrive. So this is the classic uh, office where you would have a president's chair, right? And you would have a really large desk and then you would have smaller chairs uh, on the other side for the visitors, clients, or whatever. And then you would have a hatch or bookcases at the back, and, uh, and this is the basic layout, right? Now, today, this wouldn't work in many types of businesses because, uh, for example, a financial planner might not relate to a person that is sitting in a bigger chair than they are. And uh, it's, uh, in modern times, we know if you want to really um, create a rapport with a person, it's better to sit on it in an L shape with them. Because when you sit across from them, it feels like maybe you are not, uh, you are in opposing bands. So this is the traditional way to lay out an office. And this is more what the modern office would look like. It would have, um, 
your desk would not be so deep, but they might be longer or they might turn in an L shape. And most everybody would have a computer and a keyboard. Um, but the important thing is, see where the door's here? In this place, if you rolled out a red carpet from the door to the other wall, that is the zone where you cannot be for extended periods of time. You can, uh, say, place a love seat there for somebody that's going to come sit with you and chat with you for maybe 30 minutes, but that's not where you would put your desk where you work because uh, the energy coming from the door is too strong. And it, it also makes you be sort of like in public when you, live, uh, when you work in an office and um, if your door's open, and every time something, somebody walks by, there's that uncomfortable moment in your peripheral vision, and that drains your energy. So you need to be able to see the door, but not be right in front of the door. So for example, in this case, you have the desk, and then you have the chairs against the wall. So ideally, you would turn them so the two people can have a power position. And, um, the same thing, you know, when you have an L shape, make uh, the area that you work on the most, make that uh, one that, you, that would enable you to see the door when you're working. Now sometimes, you know, because I assume some of you also have offices at home, and sometimes we go to the office store and it looks brilliant to get a corner piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. And then when you take it home, you find out there's only one way it will go and it's not comfortable from any viewpoint. So you might have gotten a, um, an, a corner unit, you know, and in this case, this would be better than that. Because with, uh, with this, you, have, you would have a little bit more of a peripheral vision to the door without being too close to the door. And uh, this would not be auspicious at all. This would be better, provided that this was not too high, you know, that covered the view of the door. But if, the, if you couldn't do anything else, this symbol here is supposed to represent a mirror. So you could have a mirror that allows you to see the entrance, and that would make you feel a lot uh, more comfortable. Now, this would be bad. If you open the door and if you run into the room, you just would um, run into the desk or run into a chair. That is not recommended. So, but if you cannot move it, you can soften this effect by placing a plant in between if there's enough room. And in this case, for example, if you couldn't move it, you could have a mirror so you could see the door. This would also, this would be the worst. If you open the door and started running and you went right into your chair, this would be the worst <laughs> feng shui position. Does anybody have this? Okay, well, good news. <laughs> so that's basically feng shui for the office. And I would like to um, share some things with you. You know, you have some handouts. And I'm going to give you some cards. Please feel free to take four or five cards, and I'll, I'll tell you why later, okay? I'll wrap it up in five minutes. <coughs> so on your handouts, when you open up, there's a description of what feng shui is, where it comes from. You know, so if you want to go home and share with your with your families or share at work with your coworkers, so it makes a little bit more sense to them. I included that, my contact information. And then you're gonna see something that says nine chi magnets. These are the things that you can have in your office or in your home. You can add more of these <coughs> to add more happiness to your space. And these are actually the things that children like. So if you bring more of these, you will have better energy in your home or your office. Next to that, there's a, something called, a, you see a square that has nine squares inside. This is what in Feng Shui we call the nine life areas. Did you know there were nine life areas? No. Well, so even becoming aware of this is going to have a positive impact in your life. And uh, I, I also put this same map on my business cards. 
only because I didn't have enough room, I had to sort of use keywords. So for example, for marriage relationships and partnerships, such as use the word love to make it fit on the card, the word wealth for wealth, prosperity, and self-worth. So the, the life areas you know, are basically wealth, fame, love, health, and there's a center, which is a center of gratitude, fun or entertainment, rest. How many of you are good at resting? <laughs> One person, so I wish I were better at resting. Career and travel. And you see the full names of these. So these are sort of the nicknames on the business card, and these are the full names on the map that I gave you in your handouts. Now on the back are some reminders of what things to do. Uh, we didn't get to talk about personalizing the office, so just let, just let me tell you this. Pretend that you, um, have had amnesia. You, you're having temporary amnesia. And you hit yourself in the car. You know, you're hitting the car coming out. And somebody has taken you to your office with, in hopes that by seeing the office you will remember something. So pretend that you don't know who this office belongs to and answer these questions. Is this a male or a female? Is this person, around what age is this person? How much does this person make? Is this person married or not? And, uh, and any other questions, you know, just basic questions about the person, and see if your reading of your own space matches your reality. And also answer the question, this, these questions, does this person want to be promoted? Or is this person too comfortable where, where they are? And also ask the question, does this person put their home affairs before work? And I'll tell you this, you should put your home life before work, but it shouldn't show at work, okay? However, you do need to have some signs that, uh, that your family is important to you at work, okay? And so another thing that you'll see is I have developed some products for, um, for feng shui. You know, I wrote two books, and you're welcome to come check out the books after the lecture. Uh, this was my first book, which has all the theory of feng shui, and it also has the practice of feng shui. This is uh, my latest book. It's just feng shui your own home. I am a friend of mine who's also a feng shui practitioner. When she saw the book, she said, are you trying to put us all out of business? <laughs> <laughs> because I really didn't hold anything when I did the book, it really. And it has a key that you can follow, you know, just answer some questions about your home, and you really can improve the energy of your home. And, uh, and thus improve the energy of your life. Feng shui is not about the place. That is a misconception. Feng shui is not about your building where you work. Feng shui is not about your house or your apartment. Feng shui is about this. It's about your life. It's about wealth and fame and reputation and love and career and all the things that matter to you. So we, make a, we work with the space in hopes of producing a change in your life. That is the purpose of feng shui, is the person, not the space. But the space is a tool. This tool does two things for the practitioner. This tool gives the practitioner information on what's going on. And it also gives you a field where you can work to produce changes in the person's life. 